Welcome to our presentation relating to chapter three of our textbook. And in this chapter, we're going to discuss how our legal system works with respect to litigation and also with respect to ADR. So let's begin. An important concept to get under your belt um, for this chapter is the idea of jurisdiction. I'll be honest with you, jurisdiction is one of the trickier topics that we'll be covering in this course, and so it's uh, useful to spend a little bit of extra time perhaps becoming familiar with it. Uh, we're not going to do a very deep dive into this subject just because it is so dense and there's so many different uh, factors in the analysis. Um, if you feel like, gosh, there's so many vocabulary words, and my heads are spinning, I'm not sure how they're all related to each other. Um, I have included some resources in um, within this chapter's folder that you might find useful in kind of helping you put the pieces together. And of course, as always, feel free to reach out to me. We can talk by phone or you can come to my office hours and we will sort it out together. Um, so let's begin. And one of the, the big issues, if you're the plaintiff or if you're the defendant in a lawsuit, is figuring out whether the lawsuit has been filed in the right place. And if you're the plaintiff, if you filed the wrong case, you've just wasted some money and some time. And if you were close to the statutory period, if you were close to the deadline by which you have to file your lawsuit and you filed the wrong place, it may well be that by the time you figure it out and file it in the right place, your time period has expired, the statute of limitations has ended, and therefore you're out of luck. So it's a pretty big deal to make sure that you're filing in the right jurisdiction, the right particular court who can hear this particular case. If you're the defendant, in most cases, you don't want to be sued at all. And so if you can look at a lawsuit and, and figure out, wait a second, a plaintiff filed in the, wrong law, in the wrong courthouse. I mean, that's wonderful news for you because it means at the very least you're going to be able to uh, delay this matter uh, for a significant period of time before it can get resolved. So, um, so jurisdiction can be a strategic issue, but it can also be a more basic issue than that. So let's first of all examine what the definition of it is. And as always, you'll see my definition terms are in red. You'll also find these terms in the textbook. Um, that is a pretty significant source for um, test questions and quiz questions in this course. Um, I almost consider this course like a, almost like a foreign language course because there's so much vocabulary that we have uh, to contend with. If you approach it as you might say a Spanish or a French course and really just consider these as vocabulary terms like you would learn like any other uh, foreign language, I think that you might find that a useful model because it's just not possible. Our brains weren't designed to commit, you know, 20 words to memory the night before the test. And most of us wouldn't even attempt to do that if we were taking a foreign language. But we kind of think, well, you know, these words in this course really aren't foreign. They're similar to ideas that I already have in my mind. Um, so it's really not that foreign. So I, I can kind of cram these into my head in short notice. That rarely works. My philosophy and, and the, the, the philosophy that I encourage you to consider is the idea that it works smarter, not harder. If you have five hours to spend on test prep, don't do it. Five hours in one stretch the night before. Do 30 minutes for the 10 days before the test. You're going to find that it's a much more pleasant experience, number one. Number two, you're going to remember a lot more of the material. And number three, you're going to retain the information a lot longer. That's especially important if you're preparing for some test other than the final exam, because think about it, the final exam is cumulative. So if you learn it just for the test, but then have to relearn it for the final, you're doubling the amount of effort that you have to take. And even if you're preparing for the final examination, I mean, presumably something in this course might have some utility to you for you in your career and so you'd like to hold on to at least some of the knowledge so for that reason try to pace your studying from the very beginning if I were taking this course I would set aside maybe um, 30 minutes to an hour a week in addition to the time that I spend reading the chapter and um, doing the assignments to outline the chapters to practice with quizlets and things like that. And so I would encourage you to do that yourselves, to, to get out your cat, your day planner and, and uh, bubble in uh, 30 minutes to an hour and maybe an extra hour um, each night the week before the test or something like that so that you'll be in, in great shape to, to, uh, to perform well in those tests. So anyway, 
I'll get off my soapbox now and we'll return to the material. What is jurisdiction? Well, this is the definition from the textbook. It's the power of a court to hear cases and to render binding decisions. And so this is, jurisdiction is the power or the authority of the court. If a court doesn't have jurisdiction over a particular party or over a particular type of claim and the lawsuit gets filed there, well, the judge is likely not to hear the case, likely to tell you, I, I don't do this kind of case. But even if the court doesn't say that and the court goes on and hears the case, even though it shouldn't, the decision that that court renders is a waste of everybody's time. It's not legally valid. If a court lacks jurisdiction, it can't render a decision that really matters. Now, jurisdiction is not as simple as does the court have jurisdiction or not. There's lots of different aspects to the topic of jurisdiction. And so let's look at those aspects a little bit. I've broken it down to four buckets, and this is a pretty common way to consider this. We're going to look at each one of these buckets kind of separately. Um, but before we go forward, let me first of all talk about limited versus general jurisdiction. Um, you've probably heard of courts with names like this bankruptcy court, um, small claims court, uh, probate court, criminal court, um, tax court, uh, trade court. You've probably heard names like that. And all of those courts' names have a particular characteristic. Let me just get out of here for a second and pull up. A... They all are of this style, subject of the court and then the word court. So it's tax court. Well, tax is the subject. Criminal court. Criminal law is the type of claims that this court handles. Uh, family court. This court obviously would handle adoptions, child custody, divorces, things along those lines. So you can tell by the, the word that comes in front of the word court what are the particular claims that this court handles. We call these types of courts courts of limited jurisdiction. And by that I mean that it doesn't handle every single, you know, let's say you are in, I'm going to come up with a better one here, bankruptcy court. If I file my divorce petition in bankruptcy court, the court's going to be going to say to me, Gruber, what were you thinking? You aren't filing for bankruptcy, you're filing for divorce. I don't do that stuff. All I do is bankruptcy. I do a lot of bankruptcies, but that's my area of expertise. That's what this court is about. I don't do anything else. And so I'm going to have to dismiss your lawsuit. You're going to have to go find somewhere else to file it. So the court is focused on a particular type of claim. And it won't hear anything other than those claims. If it attempts to hear anything other than those claims, um, its decision will be null and void. It won't have any impact. So that's one category of courts. Those are not the usual type of court. Most courts are courts of general jurisdiction, meaning that they hear any case in their particular geographical area except for those kind of quirky cases that have been carved out. So let's imagine that I am in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas. That's actually what this, uh, this uh, uh, district court would include, Collin County. So that's why I picked it. It would hear um, any cases arising out of the Eastern District, which is many, many counties. But you know what? It would not hear bankruptcies. So these courts are carved out of the bigger jurisdiction that we have here. So let me just kind of visually show that to you. Um, here we go. What I like to think about it is imagine that this is all of the disputes that occur in a particular geographic area. And then there's a few carve outs and these little carved out areas are the subjects that there are specialized courts for. But the vast majority of disputes are not going to have a carved out court. 
they're going to be in courts of general jurisdiction. That's especially true in Texas. We don't have a lot of courts of limited jurisdiction. And that makes sense because most of our state is rural. Um, many of our counties have only one judge or, uh, and in fact, some of our counties share um, a, a district court with another county. And so it wouldn't make sense to have all these specialized courts when there's just one judge in that particular jurisdiction. So as a result, we don't have a lot of, you know, specialized courts. Now, certainly in counties like Harris County, Bayer County, Travis County, Tarrant and Dallas and even Collin County, there are um, sufficient number of courts that you can have some specialization. So there are a handful of counties where it makes sense to have some specialization, and there is some of that. But the vast, vast majority of situations in Texas, and this is true for most states, is there's going to be one court, and that court's going to hear everything from divorces to criminal law things to probate to anything else that walks through the door. So most courts are going to be courts of general jurisdiction. Okay, now we're going to go on and talk about original versus appellate jurisdiction. And then after we complete talking about that, we'll talk about personal versus subject matter jurisdiction. But before we talk about these, let me just give you just a real brief summary about this. Personal jurisdiction is an umbrella term. It includes two subcategories within the larger term of personal jurisdiction. One of those umbrella terms is in rem jurisdiction. So if you think about it this way, if you think about personal jurisdiction, well, let's just do a big, think about this as being personal jurisdiction, everything in this circle, then we kind of have three, three areas here. The big area is personal jurisdiction. And then there's two smaller areas, and one is called in rem, and the other is called quasi in rem. I know it's a little confusing in that this name, this larger category name, is also the name of the largest item in this category. Uh, it's a little bit confusing. The reason why they share the same name is that virtually all personal jurisdiction matters are the personal jurisdiction. So they're almost exactly the same meaning. There's just a couple of quirky times where it doesn't fit in. Personal jurisdiction answers the question for the plaintiff, which state should I file my lawsuit in? Obviously, that's important. We've got 50 states. So you need to be sure that you're filing in the right state. If I'm supposed to file in Wyoming and I file in Montana, uh, that's not very good for me. And so uh, that's a really important question to ask. Now, in most cases, is it a big issue? No. I mean, if I'm a Texan, I'm suing a Texan, everything in the dispute handled was occurred in Texas, it's pretty obvious where I need to file my lawsuit. So there are plenty of times where it's a very easy kind of no-brainer thing to, to proceed on that you know exactly where you need to file without a lot of um, heavy thinking. But there are times where uh, there can be lots of different factors that play a role in deciding which state to file in. So why is this called personal jurisdiction? Well, in the law, we have the idea of personhood. Personhood is a little bit different than how we use this term in everyday conversation. If I were to refer to, or if I were to use the word person in everyday conversation, most of us would interpret that to mean human being. Um, that's what it means. That's what we, we think of it meaning in everyday conversation. But when we talk about the term of personhood in the law, we mean something more broad than that. Under the law, human beings are people for sure. That's not in dispute. But also other things are persons under the law. For example, corporations are persons under the law. Partnerships are persons under the law. Uh, government entities are persons under the law. So when I use the term personal, I don't mean only human beings. I mean any type of legal entity that has um, a, a, an existence apart from a human being plus human beings. Now, things that aren't persons under the law would be things like 
um, items that I own. For example, my car isn't a person under the law, nor would um, the cows that I own or my dog or my pet parakeet. Those would not be persons under the law. Okay, so when we talk about personal jurisdiction, we're ans ans asking the question, which state should I file my lawsuit in? And the way that we decide which state is we look at the characters in our lawsuit. We look at the people or the persons in our lawsuit. We look at the corporation we're suing. We look at the uh, defendant, the human being. We look at the, the plaintiff, the human being. We analyze their circumstances, and that is what leads us to the answer to this question. So we first of all have to gather data about the characters in our lawsuit. And I use the term characters a little bit, maybe I should put it in quotes, uh, a little bit, I guess tongue in cheek, uh, almost as if we were reading a novel. Obviously a lawsuit shouldn't be fiction, it should be truthful. But you know, if you think about it, if you, if you go to read, say, a Charles Dickens novel, at the very beginning of the novel there will be um, a list of characters, because uh, there's so many different characters in a Charles Dickens novel that, that they will be arranged. Um, if you've been gone to a play, you've probably seen um, a list of all of the characters that appear in the play. Usually they're listed in the order of appearance. If it's a novel, they might be grouped based upon their relationship with other characters. And that helps people keep, keep uh, the various characters straight. So if you're reading along and um, a character pops up and you can't remember his relationship to other characters, you can go back to that uh, list of characters at the beginning of the book. Oh yeah, he was the second cousin of Larry or whatever the relationship is. And it helps you make sense and continue with the story. Well, that's kind of what we're doing with personal jurisdiction. We're going to look at all of the characters in the lawsuit, all the people either suing or being sued, and we're going to consider their circumstances. And then we're going to take that information and use it to decide which state should I file my lawsuit in. And we'll talk more about this on the next few slides. Another concept is subject matter jurisdiction. This answers a different question. It answers, should I file in a state court or a federal court? Okay, now this one is a little bit easier because here we have to pick between, actually 51 if we add Puerto, excuse me, DC, 52 if we add Puerto Rico. But here, this one's a little bit easier because we only have to pick between two, state or federal. So once we answer these two questions, we know whether we're filing in state or federal court and in which state. So maybe in one case, we're gonna file in a Massachusetts state court, or maybe we're gonna file in the Arizona federal court. Or maybe we're going to file in the Arizona State Court. So again, there is, I guess, possibly as many as 102 different permutations here, if we're, of course, excluding Puerto Rico, which no reason why we would want to exclude Puerto Rico. So subject matter um, jurisdiction asks the question, or, or the, the plaintiff needs to pick whether he's going to file in a state court or a federal court. Every single state has its own state court system, and every single state has, has at least one federal court in its jurisdiction. So if personal jurisdiction is about the characters in our lawsuit, subject matter jurisdiction is about the plot, is about the subject of the lawsuit. Is the plaintiff suing because of his desire to get a divorce? Okay, well, that would be the plot of the lawsuit. Or maybe he's suing because of a car accident. That would be the plot. Maybe he's suing because he feels he was wrongfully terminated from his job. That again is the plot. So what is the theory of the case? What If you were to summarize the lawsuit in 25 words or less, what would that be? So as we said before, as we were talking about uh, limited versus general jurisdiction, if the plot of the lawsuit is a divorce, we sure don't want to file in a bankruptcy court. If the plot of our lawsuit is bankruptcy, we certainly don't want to file in a, a court that doesn't handle that particular subject. Okay, so let's go on, and now we're going to talk about original versus appellate jurisdiction. Oops. Oh, here we go. Okay, so um, original, when I hear the word original, I think first. Um, 
to be original is to be the first to do something. And so a court of original jurisdiction is the first place the plaintiff goes to to file his or her lawsuit. Another name for that is trial court. And the trial court is the, is the place where um, you, you go first. It's where you're going to have a judge, a single judge hear your case, and very likely you're going to have a jury. Um, if you are successful in that particular jurisdiction, you're happy, you get a resolution of, of your dispute, you go about your business. If you're unhappy with the resolution that you get in the trial court, then of course you can appeal that particular decision. And if you appeal it, you're going to go to an appellate court. I mean, that makes sense. An appellate court, it almost has the word appeal in it. Let me go ahead and you can see here, it's like the beginning of the word appeal. In an appellate court, you'll have three judges. Trial court, you have one. Appellate court, you have three. Why do we have the difference? Well, there's several reasons, but there's two big ones. The first big reason is that imagine that you're at trial. Um, there's a witness in the witness box. There's 12 jurors waiting, uh, or not waiting, but listening to the testimony. And um, one of the attorneys asks the witness a question. The other attorney jumps up and makes an objection. Your Honor, I object calls for hearsay. The judge considers the decision. Let's imagine for a second that there were nine judges up there considering the decision. Well, every time an, ob an objection is made, those nine judges are going to have to get together and discuss it. Well, what do you think? Oh, I think it was hearsay. No, I don't think it is hearsay. Well, what about that exception? Well, what about this exception? What about this case? Well, what do you think? You can see that if you had more than one judge, you would have every single objection would probably last at least several minutes to resolve and could well last several hours. Well, there's the jury cooling its heels. There's the poor witness who's in the witness box waiting, not sure what he's supposed to do. The jury's going to get frustrated. The witness is going to get kind of unglued after a while, and it's not a very good situation. In a trial situation, you want a quick answer. You recognize that you might not get a perfect answer. I mean, after all, a judge is, despite what they sometimes think about themselves, he's or she's only human. He or she makes mistakes, especially when he or she is ruling from the bench without having the ability to reflect or, or look at a legal, uh, legal sco uh, scholarship to figure out the answer. So he's going to get the facts wrong or the decision wrong sometimes. But we really value speed under those circumstances, and so it's okay that he occasionally will make a mistake. But when we get to the appellate level, we're in a very different circumstance. Now there is no jury waiting. There is no witness in the witness box. Everybody's gone home, and uh, there's not that sense of time urgency. A case on appeal usually is going to be on appeal for probably about 18 months to, say, three years. So uh, we really have the luxury of spending a few moments pausing and thinking about this. So that's one reason that we can have three judges in an appellate court and only one judge in a trial court. Only about 10% of all cases are appealed, so there's a lot fewer cases that go through the appeal system than go to trial. And as a result, we can afford to invest more resources in the appeals, because if we had multiple judges at every trial court, think about you and me as taxpayers, we'd be paying for these judges. I mean, we're still paying for the judges in the appellate court system, but because there's so many fewer appeals than there are initial cases, it's not nearly as great a burden on, on us as taxpayers. So that's a second reason that we have more judges in the appellate system than we do in the trial court system. A third reason is that appellate decisions are much more important overall. A trial court doesn't issue written opinions in most cases. There's some exceptions, but uh, the, in the majority of cases, the decision that he or she renders um, isn't published. It's not private. It's something that's a matter of, of public record, but it isn't something that other judges are very likely to refer to. So the whole idea of precedent doesn't have a lot of relevance to trial court. So the bottom line is if a trial court messes up, he or she, that judge is probably just messing things up for those two individual litigants. But when an appellate court messes up, when an appellate court issues the wrong decision, 
Well, he's not, that court's not affecting just those two litigants, but all the other similar cases out there because of the importance of stare decisis, the importance of precedent. So it becomes much more important for an appellate court to get things right. And that's another reason for us to invest a significant amount of resource. A neat thing we have in Texas is that the name of our uh, trial courts of original jurisdiction that are general jurisdiction courts are called district courts. And that name makes a lot of sense because unlike the other names that we were talking about, let me just flip over here for a second. Tax court, criminal court, family court, bankruptcy court. A district court, um, the, you know, that first word district doesn't tell you anything about the subject of the lawsuit. It gives you geographic limitations. So basically it's saying every single case that arises in this geographic district, this court can handle. At least that's the, the gist of it. And of course the assumption is that any carved out subjects that we've, we've got specialized courts, we're going to you know, put those into those specialized courts. But if there isn't a carved out court, this court can hear it all basically. And so that's the name we have in Texas for a court of general jurisdiction. We call it a district court. We also call it that if it's in our federal court system. Now the districts aren't the same size. Typically in Texas, as is true for most, count, most states, a district is the same size as the county. In Texas, I say there's some less populous state, the counties that share a district court with another county. In the federal system, districts are much bigger. In Texas, we have over 260 counties, but we only have four districts. And there are no states that have more than um, four district courts. Um, that's a little bit misleading way of describing it. I'll tell you more about it later on. But you can see how in Texas, each federal district will include lots and lots of state uh, counties. And that's true in most cases. So even though we use the same term, district court, for both the state court system in Texas and the federal court system, the sizes of the district are dramatically different. So let's imagine that you've gone to trial, maybe you're the plaintiff, maybe you're the defendant, doesn't matter, and you are not happy with what happened. You lost, or at least you feel like you didn't win everything that you should have won. And so now you're going to appeal your, the decision. Well, um, you have a right to appeal automatically. You can go to that court uh, to, the, to the next uh, high, high court and say, hey, I feel like I was done wrong in the trial court level. Um, but you can't, well, you can certainly do that. You have an automatic right to appeal. You can't go in and say, I'm mad, you need to change it. At least you can't say that and be very effective. You have to uh, present reasons why you feel that the decision was incorrect. And typically we're going to be looking at um, well, I guess I, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself. That, uh, let me first of all talk about how it's resolved in appellate court. So typically, if you lose at the trial court and you're appealing to appellate court, you're going to be looking at questions of law. You're going to look at the transcripts of the trial and say, well, Your, your Honor, you, appellate judges, um, this is what I think the trial judge did that was wrong. And because this was a serious problem, I think you ought to overturn that trial court decision. And then the appellate court will have to decide whether it agrees with you or doesn't agree with you. As I said previously, about 10% of all cases are appealed and about 10% of all appeals are successful uh, for the person who filed the appeal. So that means there's about a 1% chance of the, what happened in the trial court to be reversed on appeal. So as you can see, yes, we do have an appellate process, but it's not really very likely to be successful. Most of the time, what happens at the trial court is what the final result will be. So let's go back to the trial court. We're no longer in the appellate court, we're in the trial court. And we um, um, are trying to figure out how we're going to present the information. What stuff do we tell the jury and what stuff do we talk to about with the judge? Well, judges handle legal issues. And in this analysis, I'm assuming that we have a jury. Sometimes um, you don't have a jury, not too frequently, but every now and again, the, the parties will have decided to waive their right to a jury trial. And in that situation, the, we call that a bench trial, and the judge acts as the jury and the judge. But let's assume this is a jury trial, non-bench trial, 
and so the jury is is seated so what questions does the jury answer well questions of fact they are there to decide for example uh, did Bob murder Teresa or did Louise run the red light that caused the car accident um, a judge isn't really any more qualified to answer questions of fact than the members of the public public um, so that's not the judge's area of expertise the jury is hearing evidence deciding who they find to be credible how they're going to figure out what really happened at the end of the day so that's what the jury does what the judge does is he or she answers questions of law he or she determines what the law is that applies into these circumstances and figures out um, uh, how how that application is going to affect the progress of the case uh, for example imagine that uh, bob is suing teresa about a car accident case and the statutory period for this particular claim is four years well bob waited four years and one month to file his lawsuit and so now teresa has filed a motion saying your honor Bob waited too late to file this lawsuit. You ought to dismiss this lawsuit at this time. Well, that's not a question of fact. That's a question of law that the judge will answer. The judge will, you know, do the calculate, you know, figure out what the statutory period is and do a calculation to see is which side of that line Bob is on. And if Bob had waited too long and doesn't have a legal excuse for that that the judge considers acceptable then the case will be thrown out even if the underlying facts of the case are good for Bob so that's an example of a question of law where the judge focuses his attention on that the appellate court is almost exclusively going to deal with questions of law it is not going to re-examine questions of fact that the jury is resolved and that makes sense because after all the appellate court hasn't heard any live testimony is reading just a transcript and it's really impossible when you read a transcript to determine who was more credible than another person you don't get to see the body language you don't get to see the tone of their voice you don't get a lot of clues as to um, how credible that person might have been and the appellate judges recognize that fact so they aren't going to second-guess the jury and say well you know we happen to believe Teresa more than Bob and so we're going to rule in favor of Teresa even though the jury found Bob to be more credible now it's very unusual for an appellate court to overrule a jury's decision um, we won't go into the circumstances they will but as a general rule they're going to be focusing on the judge's actions the judge's application of law because this has nothing to do with uh, the credibility of testimony it has to do with what are the rules about what the statutory period is for this particular claim and also a, a person who is reading the transcript two years later in is in is is in as good a position to uh, decide what that question of law is than the judge who was hearing that initial case okay so now we're going to talk we've talked about original versus appellate jurisdiction <coughs> we've talked about limited versus general jurisdiction now we're going to start talking about these two concepts in a little bit more detail so the first is in personam jurisdiction this is just another term for personal jurisdiction um, they mean the same thing this is one the first ones in Latin and then this is kind of translated into English so what is in personam jurisdiction what's well, the power of the court there's no surprise there because we know that jurisdiction is about the power of a court so this part right here is just reiterating the definition of jurisdiction but as we go on this is where we're going to start getting this part of the definition to require a party usually the defendant or a witness to come before the court so that's when that personal comes in because remember we talked about the characters in the lawsuit the human beings and the corporations and other other legal entities so we're talking about the power of the court to make somebody appear before it obviously the court has to have that type of authority over that person in order to render a decision in a particular case 
and this is important, personal jurisdiction extends only to the state's borders in the state court and across the court's geographic district in the federal system. Okay, so if you think about, um, uh, let's imagine we're in the Texas state court system, and let's say that um, Bob is suing Larry. Uh, Bob lives in Texas. Um, Bob and Larry were in a car accident in Oklahoma. Larry's never been to the state of Texas before. He's a lifelong Oklahoman. But you know what? Bob doesn't really want to sue Larry, sue Larry in Oklahoma. That's not convenient for Bob. So Bob sues Larry in Texas. Um, well, Larry is probably going to object and say that Texas state court doesn't have jurisdiction over Larry because Larry's never come to Texas. The accident didn't happen here. Larry doesn't own anything in Texas. And that if all that is true, then Larry's right. The Texas state court doesn't have jurisdiction over Larry. Um, but let's imagine a little bit different scenario. Again, there's a car accident between Bob and Larry. Larry is a lifelong Oklahoman. Bob do, does live in Texas. The car accident even happened in Oklahoma, but Larry routinely comes to Texas. He does business in Texas. He uh, maybe owns some land in Texas. He vacations in Texas. He has family in Texas. He has all kinds of ties to Texas. And so again, Bob sues Larry in Texas State Court. Larry again objects, hey, I, sh I want to be sued in Oklahoma. I don't want to be sued in Texas. But all that evidence of Larry's ties to Texas come to light, and the judge is, is going to rule under those circumstances that, well, Larry, you've submitted to the personal jurisdiction of this court by all of these ties you've chosen to have to the state of Texas. And so therefore, you can't now uh, complain about the fact that you're being sued in Texas. You can't complain successfully. So the rule is that a person can be sued in the state in which they are a resident, as well as potentially other states. It's a pretty complex analysis to decide ex uh, what states a person can be sued in and what states a person cannot be sued in. But the, the general concept is always in your own state and sometimes in other states. In order to complete this analysis, the court is going to consider personal jurisdiction, but the court also has to consider another concept, and that is the, the long-arm statute. The long-arm statute is a statute in a particular state, and the way I like to think of it is um, if you ever, um, uh, uh, when you were, you're probably saying your, your parents or your grandparents would have told you about. Um, if you've ever heard of the character Gumby, Gumby was this kind of green guy. He was very stretchy, and his arms would reach really long, and his legs would reach really long. And so whenever I hear long arm statute, I think of Gumby. And what, what the, the metaphor that um, resonates for me in this area is that I imagine um, this, a particular state using a long arm statute, using Gumby essentially, to reach over its borders into that other state and plucks that individual, that defendant, up and plops them down into the state. Obviously, that doesn't happen literally. Um, nobody is, you know, uh, carting people over state lines in that way, but it happens metaphorically. Um, and basically what happens is that that state statute tells the courts in that state, you have authority to hear cases assuming that personal jurisdiction exists. There's a big case in this area. Let me just show you where you'll find out information on this case. It's um, the International Shoe versus Washington case. By the way, here's the other resource that I was telling you about the jurisdictional questions that you might find of value. I'm not going to go through the international shoe case. I just put this little shoe here as a little bit of a reminder of that case. If you want to do a deeper dive into exactly how the court decides when it has personal jurisdiction and when it doesn't. I do have the definitions for NREM and quasi-NREM. You may recall these are the fairly narrow circumstances under that umbrella term personal jurisdiction that are a little bit different. We can see in the term personal jurisdiction, we're talking about people, right? Either legal people or corporations or human beings, things along those lines. In rem, the term rem in Latin means thing. So this is about persons and this is about stuff. 
non-human beings, non even corporations. So this would be about my dog, about my car, about my land, things like that. So that's what NREM is about. NREM jurisdiction is the power of the court. Again, we have that power of the court idea that we have for jurisdiction. So power of the court is a definition for jurisdiction. And NREM is this next part. It's the power of the court over property of an out-of-state defendant when the property or status, whatever that status is, is within the court's jurisdiction. So let's say we're going to change the facts. Bob is suing Larry, but he's suing Larry about, um, he thinks that the, the, paint, the Monet painting that Larry has hanging in Larry's apartment really belongs to Bob. Well, Larry lives in Oklahoma, so the Monet painting is in Oklahoma. And so Bob is saying, I want my painting back. Well, that's a thing. The painting is. And so Bob might sue based upon in rem jurisdiction. And of course, in that situation, you have to sue in Oklahoma because that's the state where the painting is located. There's a lot of procedural reasons why usually people don't sue based upon in rem jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction is usually preferred, but it is one of the tools in the arsenal of the uh, plaintiff. The final category under this umbrella term personal jurisdiction is quasi in rem. The term quasi, I'm going to give you a very loosey-goosey kind of definition of it. Quasi means kind of, sort of, but not quite. Um, so what is quasi in rem jurisdiction? Um, it's a type of jurisdiction exercised by a court over, again, the out-of-state defendant's property that is within the boundaries of the court. So this is similar to in rem, but now we're going to get to the quasi part in this next sentence. It applies to personal suits against the defendant in which the property is not the source. This is the key word, not the source of the conflict, but is sought as compensation for the plaintiff. So in my in rem jurisdiction example, Bob was suing Larry about getting the money back. And the basis of him asserting in rem jurisdiction was the Monet. But let's present a different scenario. Bob is suing Larry again, and Bob knows that Larry owns his Monet. But Bob isn't suing Larry about the Monet. Bob has no legal claim to the Monet. But Bob and Larry were in a bad car accident, and Bob thinks that um, Larry owes him money. So Bob researches Larry and discovers that he owns his priceless Monet. And so he says, well, you know what? I'm going to sue based upon quasi in room jurisdiction. The Monet that Larry owns is in Oklahoma. Even though I don't have a claim to ownership of the Monet, if I win my lawsuit, um, I would like to use that Monet painting as the way that I collect the judgment that I have against Larry. So let's say the Monet, well, I guess Monet would be worth more than, more than this, but let's imagine it's a really cheap Monet. <laughs> anyway, the, the Monet is only worth $300,000. And Bob thinks that when he wins his lawsuit, he'll get about $300,000 um, from the jury. Well, then he can just collect based upon the value or collect the painting, and that would satisfy the judgment. So again, in rim and quasi in rim jurisdiction are real things, but they're very rarely seen. The vast majority of time, the plaintiff is going to sue based upon in person personal jurisdiction, but he doesn't have to. Any one of these three will work. Just this is overwhelmingly preferred. So the plaintiff, um, or excuse me, yeah, the plaintiff has to have either personal has to have personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction, if you think about these as being two buckets. If the plaintiff or if the court where the plaintiff picks to file the lawsuit has only one of these, then that court cannot hear the case. So if it has personal but not subject matter, the court can't hear the case. If it has subject matter but not personal, the court can't hear the case. Um, and similarly, going back here, if it's a court of appellate jurisdiction, but it should, at this stage in the proceedings, it should be in a court of original jurisdiction, court can't hear the case. Or let's say it's a court of limited jurisdiction, but this particular dispute should have been filed in a court of general jurisdiction, can't hear the case. So the court has to have all four of the relevant types of jurisdiction in order to proceed. 
but these are the ones that are most likely to present challenges and of course you have to have both. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about subject matter jurisdiction. So in the next slide we're going to go into more detail, but let's just look at the definition here. Subject matter jurisdiction is the power of the court. Again, this is just the definition relating to jurisdiction. Over the type of case presented to it. So what's the plot of the case? Is it about a bankruptcy? Is it about um, a car accident case? Is it about a breach of contract case? That particular category of cases is going to inform the court about whether it has the authority to hear the case. And again, subject matter jurisdiction cases is about do I file in federal court or do I file in state court? So let's see a little bit more about this. There's lots of different ways of dividing up the ways uh, that, that you sort through a subject matter jurisdiction. Um, so I'm not going to present this as the only method of doing it. It's just the one we're going to use in our case. So we have here five buckets. The usual rule, the default rule is, let me go ahead and write this out on my little slide here. The default rule is file in a state court of general jurisdiction. You need a special reason to file in federal court. You may have heard the expression at some point, perhaps, that the expression is don't make a federal case out of it. It means don't make a big deal out of something that's not a big deal. And that goes back to this idea. The idea that it's hard to get into federal court because our, our federalist system is designed for our state court system to be the main place you go to resolve your disputes. Yes, we have a federal court system, but it's not really intended to handle the run of the mill, uh, disputes that arise for most of us in, in everyday life. And so you need some special circumstances to get into federal court. If you don't have those special circumstances, no worries, you just file in state court. So let's look at what those special reasons are that you get to go to federal court. So we have five buckets here. One is if you are um, suing based upon a U.S. constitutional claim. Let's say that I am a resident of Frisco, Texas, and um, there is a mayoral campaign going on, and my candidate for mayor is Bob Green, and he is running against Sally uh, Brown. Um, anyway, um, I want to put a sign in my yard that advertises my support for Bob Green. My next door neighbor has a sign in his yard advertising for Sally Brown. Um, I would like for the sign to, my sign to be in the color green, and I would like for it to have the word green on it. So people driving past would know that I am supporting Bob Green. Well, um, apparently Sally Brown is more popular with the current members of the city council because they passed a resolution saying there can be no signs in yards in the city of Frisco that are either the color green or that include the word green. Hmm. Well, um, I still put up my sign. A uh, Frisco police officer drives by my house, and he issues me a ticket for having this sign in my yard that says, I'm voting for Bob Green, and that is in the color green. And it's a $100 uh, fine. And so I decide that my constitutional rights of freedom of speech have been abridged, and I file a lawsuit. Well, the basis of my claim is going to be the U.S. Constitution. As a result, because it ha this is a federal document, I can file that in federal court if I want. Okay, so that's one way that you end up getting into federal court. Another way is when you are suing about, and this is again a, a repetition here, when you're suing about a federal statute or a treaty or the U.S. Constitution. So let's say that um, I'm an employee of Sally Brown, we'll say, and she actually employs about 30 employees. Anyway, I come to work one day and Sally says to me, Gruber, 
I've heard that you're a Methodist. I don't like Methodists. I don't want them working for me. This will be your last day employed here. Um, go about your business. Leave my place of employment. I go home. I do a little bit of research, and I find out that religious discrimination is unlawful under federal law. It's also unlawful under state law, but we're focusing on federal law right now. And as a result, um, so I'm going to actually, I'm going to just to make this a little clear, I'm going to cross this one out because this is a repetition here. Um, as a result, um, because I'm suing under a federal statute, I can file my lawsuit in federal court. Let's imagine another scenario. I am a U.S. trucking company. Um, I uh, uh, go down to Mexico and load my truck with strawberries and I cross over into the United States and I deliver those all the way up in Canada to uh, grocery stores in Canada that want to sell uh, Mexican strawberries. So I'm crossing two international borders. Because I am a U.S.-based trucking company, I have to follow all of the U.S. safety laws about the features that my uh, semi has to have. But it turns out that Canadian and Mexican trucking companies don't have to follow all of those same rules. Many of the rules I have to follow um, make driving on, uh, you know, driving all these miles more expensive because I have to have more um, safety gear on my vehicle. Um, that that those those uh, uh, additions cost money. Plus, they make my truck heavier, which means I use up more. A gasoline for each mile I, I cover. And so as a result, Canadian and Mexican trucking companies are able to do it less expensively so they can bid for this business and undercut um, the amount of money that, that I have to, to charge for it. So they are getting more and more of this particular business. And so I um, sue under NAFTA and the North American Free Trade Act saying that this isn't fair for me. Well, since I'm suing under a U.S. treaty, that would be filed under federal court. So that's an example of how we get into federal court under these bases. Another situation would be one state suing another state. Imagine for a second that the state of Oklahoma decides to dam up the Red River. And so now there is no more water in Lake Texoma, and there are communities in Texas that uh, don't have any water for their uh, water system. Well, uh, Texas considers that a violation of the law to uh, uh, reroute the uh, the Red River so that it doesn't cross over into Texas. So the state of Oklahoma, excuse me, the state of Texas sues the state of Oklahoma. Well, of course, the state of Texas would like to sue the state of Oklahoma in Texas state courts. I mean, they would be guaranteed a friendly judge, and they would be guaranteed a friendly jury pool. Similarly, the state of Oklahoma would like to be able to restrict where it can be sued. It would like to be sued in an Oklahoma state court, where it would have a friendly judge and a friendly jury. You can see how neither one of those results would be very fair, wouldn't really be advancing justice. So the system that we've developed is that you a state suing another state, that state has to go to the federal system. Now, it's still going to be in a particular state, uh, so it's not completely fair. Obviously, if Texas is suing Oklahoma, Texas is going to file its lawsuit in a Texas federal court. But still, it'll be a federal court, not a state court. So there's a little bit uh, perhaps more more fairness associated with it. So that's another basis that can uh, result in, in the case being filed in federal court. A third way to get into federal court is when the United States government is a party. And that could be, oh, let me, before we go into it, let me talk about this one a little bit more. Sometimes people get confused about this basis and think that when one state is suing a citizen of another state, so let's imagine that Bob murdered Larry. After the car accident in Oklahoma, Bob got so mad and he just shot Larry. Larry's dead. Bob goes across the Texas, uh, goes across the Red River actually, and enters Texas. And he is arrested in Texas for the murder of Larry. And the state of Oklahoma decides to extradite 
Bob back to Oklahoma. So it files a petition saying, hey, state of Texas, we want Larry over here, excuse me, Bob over here so we can prosecute him. Well, that would be the state of Oklahoma versus Bob. Um, that is not one state suing another state. So that does not have to be in federal court, and it very rarely would be in federal court. We only have this when one state is suing another state, the state of Texas versus the state of Oklahoma, or vice versa. Okay, let's go on to our third category, which is when the U.S. government is a party. So if I'm suing the U.S. government, so it's Groover versus United States government, or maybe it's United States government versus Groover. It doesn't matter whether the government is a plaintiff or a defendant. It doesn't even have to be the whole government. Maybe it's one uh, department within the government. Um, it, it, whatever the circumstances are, if the U.S. government is being sued, it has to be in federal court. I think that makes sense because after all, the federal government is supreme over the states. And if so if the federal government would have to follow what a state court uh, told it had to, had to do, um, then that whole idea of uh, the, the supremacy of the federal government would be undermined. So the federal government doesn't have to listen to state court uh, judges, just to federal court judges. The, the two big categories of subject matter jurisdiction are these bottom two. I've already talked about the federal question. And by the way, when you see the word federal question, just think statute or document, federal document. This is an important one for sure, but this is the big one, the most important basis for federal jurisdiction, and that is what we call diversity of citizenship. A kind of a quirk of uh, U.S. law is, again, that idea of federalism, that we have both state governments and federal governments. In many countries in the world, there is some type of local government structure, but in most cases, that local government structure is a creature of the authority of the central government, not so much its own basis for authority. But that's not the case in our particular country. Uh, the state of Texas doesn't exist as a, uh, an outlying area of the federal government. It has its own source of authority, its own source of power, um, apart from the power of the federal government. And in some areas, it has more power than the federal government. Um, and so that's our federalist system. As a result of, of our federalism, it turns out that everyone who is a U.S. citizen is also a citizen of a state. So, for example, I'm a U.S. citizen. I live in the state of Texas, so that means I'm a citizen of the United States of America, and I'm also a citizen of the state of Texas. If I move to Oklahoma and I live there for many, many months, I will cease to be a citizen of Texas, and I will become a citizen of the state of Oklahoma. Obviously, I will still be a U.S. citizen under either circumstance. Um, I can only be a citizen of one state at a time, but I'm always a citizen of one state. I won't go through all the permutations, but there's lots of different fact patterns that flows from that. So when we use the term here, citizenship, we're really talking about state citizenship usually. So let's imagine for a second that none of these first three categories would get under, the, because of the particular facts of my lawsuit, would give the federal court authority to hear my case. So I'm not gonna be able to use any of these bases up here. My last chance for having a basis to file my lawsuit in a federal court is gonna be if I satisfy the requirements for diversity of citizenship. I only need one reason one of these four reasons to get into federal court, but I do need to have one. Okay, so I'm going to shoot for this last one. This means there has to be diversity of citizenship. So if I'm the plaintiff, if I'm Larry and I'm suing Bob, and Larry is a citizen of Oklahoma and Bob is a citizen of Texas, guess what? We have diversity of citizenship um, because um, of the difference in citizenship. But it's not enough that you have diversity of citizenship. You need a second thing for this category. The amount in dispute has to be more than $75,000. This amount is statutory. It's going to go up from time to time. When I graduated from law school, the amount was 50000 
there's been a lot of discussion that it ought to go up higher. Um, my guess is that it will in the not too distant future. So this number is not carved in stone by any means. But for now, this is at least, excuse me, not at least, but more than $75,000. So if Larry is an Oklahoman and Bob is a Texan and Larry sues Bob for $74,000, that's not enough to get into federal court. This more than $75,000 requirement applies only to this last category. In any of these other uh, bases for federal jurisdiction, the amount in controversy is not relevant. It could be, again, going back to my U.S. Constitution question, I was only fined $100. So obviously that's a lot less, than more than 75000 but I don't need a certain amount for this particular category. The, uh, ca the way that one figures out diversity of citizenship is very, very complex. I'm not going to go through all the permutations of it. Just know that um, I've, I've distilled it to a pretty... Uh, bare bones a structure for that idea. Let's go on. Venue. Venue is an analysis that the lit, that the uh, attorneys do after they have completed the jurisdictional analysis. One of the things about jurisdiction is that many times when you go through this analysis, you know, you consider personal jurisdiction, you consider subject matter jurisdiction, it can end up that there are multiple places that that plaintiff can file the lawsuit. It might be that he can file in federal court and state court. It might be that there's several states he can file in. But the plaintiff, if there's more than one place, the plaintiff gets to pick, okay? I'm choosing um, Arkansas federal court, um, assuming that he, he satisfies the jurisdictional requirements, then that can be where the case is gonna be filed. So once the uh, plaintiff has picked the particular state and whether it's gonna be state or federal, now he has to drill down within that state and decide which district he's going to file. So let's assume that he's picked federal court in Arkansas. Let's assume for a second that there are two district courts in Arkansas. We'll say that they're the southern and the northern. I'm not sure that's the case, but just for the sake of argument, we're going to say that. Now we have to decide where venue is appropriate. Venue is not the same thing as jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the power of the court to hear a case. If a single court, if a single state court can hear a case, all state courts in that state can hear that case. If a single court in the federal system in that particular state can hear a case, all federal courts in that system have the authority to hear the case. So venue is not about jurisdiction. It, if, if, it, if one court has jurisdiction, they all do. But it's about what is the most appropriate place for this case to proceed. Now just because it has jurisdiction doesn't mean that it's convenient. Think about Texas for a second. Let's say that Bob and Larry are both uh, residents of Texarkana, Texas. They're in a, a fender bender in Texarkana, in Texarkana County. Uh, Bob, uh, two days after the car accident, moves to El Paso, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Bob decides to file his lawsuit in El Paso State Court. Well, the El Paso State Court absolutely has jurisdiction because a Texarkana State Court would have had jurisdiction. So there's no dispute about that. So Larry can't say that that El, um, El Paso County uh, District Court lacks jurisdiction, but what he can say is the venue is inappropriate because after all, the car accident didn't happen in El Paso County. Larry's not from El Paso County. Um, so it, it, uh, Larry would have a good argument that, the law, that this is not an appropriate place to file it, even though jurisdiction would exist there. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the state versus our federal, our state system versus our federal system. So you have a little bit uh, more robust understanding about it. We've, we've touched on that a little bit when we were talking about subject matter jurisdiction, but let's do a bit of a deeper dive. This is an overview of our Texas court system. You can see there's a lot of granularity on this slide. I'm not going to expect that you know um, very much of this information. I'm going to tell you right now the things that I care about you knowing. Okay, we're going to start with our district courts. This is
this is our court uh, this is our court of general jurisdiction this is where the majority of the disputes are going to be filed courts under here are courts of limited jurisdiction some of them are limited because they handle only particular issues most of them are limited because the amount in controversy is smaller okay then of course we have our appellate courts we happen to have 14 in Texas and they handle both civil and criminal cases but our courts bifurcate when we get to the highest level to our highest courts we have a Texas Supreme Court it handles only civil cases and our Texas Court of Criminal Appeals well guess what it handles <laughs> pretty easy one right there now the names for many people suggest that well maybe this court the Texas Supreme Court is more senior or more powerful than Texas Court of Criminal Appeals for the most part that is not correct they are equal courts a criminal case is never going to go before the Texas Supreme Court and a civil case is never going to go in front of a court of criminal appeals there are a few things that the Texas Supreme Court does that the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals doesn't do and so I'm not going to say that it doesn't have a little bit more power but in terms of adjudicating cases uh, there's no way that a case could end up in in both of these courts it's going to be in one or the other um, this system of having two highest courts is very unusual as far as I know Texas and Oklahoma are the only two states that have it you do need to know about this difference so be sure to flag that you won't find it in the textbook because it's not a Texas specific book so um, be sure to put that in your notes now so that you'll be able to review it for the uh, for the test let's go on to the next slide here is a picture of the United States divided up into the federal appellate courts you can see that we're here in Texas we're in the Fifth Circuit the Fifth Circuit has three states Texas Louisiana and Mississippi so basically just go east and those are our, our um, uh, uh, courts that are in our jurisdiction you can see here that Right here is where a uh, Collin County is this is the Eastern District this is the Northern District this is the Western District and this is the Southern District um, so you can see that Dallas County is in the Northern District Collin County which is of course north of Dallas County is in the Eastern District El Paso is over here in the Western District and Houston is right here in the Southern District and you can see that our ninth district is by far our largest district in terms of geography um, it is also our most populated district because it has you know California in it um, at some point I imagine that the Ninth Circuit will be broken up and we'll have um, yet another circuit but that hasn't happened yet um, at one point in time the fifth circuit included the 11th circuit but then the 11th circuit um, became its own circuit so anyway this gives you an overview you are responsible for knowing that Collin County is in the Eastern District that at Dallas is in the Northern District that the Louisiana Mississippi and Texas are in the fifth circuit of the federal system This is a schema of how the federal court system works. So we have here the district courts. This is like in the state system, the trial court, the court of original jurisdiction. It looks like that there's six kind of equally sized courts and this is just one of six. That's very misleading. There's a lot more courts in this category than in any of these other categories. Even if you were to add all these up, this would still be a lot more of the activity so this is not drawn to scale or into in terms of importance so a case is heard in a district court and then it's going to go almost always to one of the 12 circuit courts let me just flip back here and you may say wait a second 12 but there were just 11 here right so where'd you get 12 from well right up here where the District of Columbia is there's a DC circuit so that's the 12th it doesn't have a number associated with it it's just called the DC circuits the most prestigious of the circuits um, so a case that is filed say in the Eastern District of Texas somebody appeals it it's going to go to the Fifth Circuit 
Um, and then let's say somebody wants to appeal that judgment, it's going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is by far the, the most common route. These other routes over here to the federal circuit, unusual. All these other courts, pretty unusual circumstances. So um, it's a little misleading. The, this is the, the route that you're going to see time and time again. Okay, so now we've talked about the federal system and the state system. We're going to talk about some threshold systems, excuse me, some threshold requirements uh, before you can file a lawsuit. What does the plaintiff need to demonstrate in order to be allowed to proceed with this lawsuit? Generally, we think about three requirements. One is standing, another is case or controversy, a third is ripeness. A standing has nothing to do with whether you have good posture or not. It has to do with whether um, you have a connection to the dispute. Imagine for a second that Bob punches Larry in the nose. Larry's a really nice guy. He doesn't want to sue Bob, but you know, as a result of his injuries, Larry needed medical attention. He had to take off some time from work, and um, he uh, uh, has, continues to suffer some, some pain and some disfigurement as a result of the incident. But he's decided now he's going to forgive and forget, move on with his life. He's not going to sue Bob. Well, I'm Larry's best friend, and I'm just shocked at what Bob did. I think Bob needs to be taught a lesson, plus Larry is entitled to money. So I decide I'm going to sue Bob. Um, because I know that once the jury hears the facts, they're going to make Bob pay Larry a lot of money. So I filed this lawsuit, and then and Bob is a defendant. But the first thing Bob is going to do is say, hey, Your Honor, Groover lacks standing. She's not even alleging that I punched her. She's alleging that I punched Bob, I mean, uh, Larry. Maybe I punched Larry, maybe I didn't. That's not really the point here. But based upon what Groover's alleging, I didn't hurt her. I don't have, uh, Groover does not have a sufficient connection to the lawsuit. And in this case, Bob would be right. Larry can sue Bob, but Groover can't sue Bob under those facts. Another threshold issue that we need to contend with is whether there's a case or controversy. This is from the U.S. Constitution. Another term for this is justiciable controversy. Um, this relates to uh, whether there is a uh, uh, um, a current dispute between the parties. Let me give you an example. Bob and I are in a contract together, um, and um, under the terms of the contract, I'm supposed to deliver a thousand widgets to him in a month, and he's going to pay me ten thousand dollars for that. Well, it just so happens that I've had some problems with my equipment. I'm, I am, oh, uh, I'm supposed, in, within 30 days, I'm supposed to produce 7,000 widgets for my various customers. But because my machinery isn't working, I know I'm not going to be able to produce all 7,000 widgets. And so I'm trying to decide which contract I ought to break. And so um, I look at all the terms of my contracts to figure out which one is going to be the least expensive for me to break, because I'm going to have to break one. And there's a provision in my contract with Bob that I just don't know how the court's going to interpret it. Um, and so what, I, what I, I would like to file in the court is I'd like to file a notice saying, Your Honor, um, if I don't fulfill my contract with Bob, um, how are you going to interpret this clause in the contract? Are you going to make me pay Bob, you know, $5 per widget I don't give him? Or maybe it's only going to be $2. It's, it's ambiguous. Well, the court will say, we're not giving you an opinion until there's actual uh, dispute between the two of you. Um, you haven't breached yet. Once you breach, then Bob will have to decide whether he sues you or not, and then we'll resolve the question. But we're not giving you an advisory opinion. We're not going to predict what the future holds. Court has this policy for lots of reasons. I mean, one is that they have more business and they know what to do with, so the last thing they need is more work, and that's what this would be. So that's one reason that they require a case or controversy. A second reason is that they need to have two zealous advocates, the plaintiff and the defendant. Under this fact pattern, the defendant is somewhat unengaged at this point because there is no dispute. 
he hasn't geared up. He doesn't know whether he's going to need to gear up or not, so he's not investing as many resources as he might. As a result, our system isn't going to work very well because you need to have both parties fully engaged so that the best arguments are being advanced to the court. The third reason that the court isn't likely to want to decide a case, something that isn't a case or controversy, is that the court wants the, the, the person who's trying to make a decision about what to do, the court wants that person to fulfill his obligations. Um, he, if, if, if the, uh, the litigant is saying, listen, I can either fulfill my contractual obligations or not, I want you to tell me what's in my best interest, the court's going to say, wait a second, you sign this contract, do what you're supposed to do. We're not going to help you get out of what you said you were going to do. That's not our job. If you choose not to fill your contract, yes, you know, we'll, we'll look at the law, um, but, but right now that's not our circumstance, and we're not going to help you out in violating your contract with, with the other party. So for those reasons, the court is not likely to handle things that are not cases or controversies yet. And finally, this is kind of a related concept, but this is the idea of ripeness. Sometimes something is a case or controversy, but it's not quite ripe. It's not quite to the point in the progression of the case that um, it's really ready for a final decision uh, to, be, to be resolved. Um, and so that would be a, another example of the, the ripeness idea. An example of ripeness would be this. Um, so imagine, well, uh, um, imagine that, um, actually there's a, a line of cases on this line. So this is an, ex this is an example of the exception to the ripeness requirement. Um, the uh, one of the challenges with establishing ripeness in case or controversy in abortion cases is that a pregnancy only lasts nine months. And so imagine that a woman uh, discovers that she's pregnant, and let's say she discovers it as soon as medically possible. So she discovers it at the four week point in her pregnancy. And she immediately knows that she wants to have an abortion. But let's say in her jurisdiction, abortion is unlawful. So she immediately files a lawsuit saying um, that um, uh, she wants to have an abortion, but it's unlawful. So she wants to make sure she's allowed to do it. Well, she definitely has standing. I mean, she's pregnant. She wants to have this done. There definitely is a case or controversy because this, the state in this particular area doesn't want her to have the abortion that she wants to have. Um, and, and it's definitely ripe at this point. She's, um, uh, pregnant. Uh, she can have the abortion now. It's medically possible to have the abortion and yet she's being stopped from having it. So let's assume, we'll go back, say, to the Roe v. Wade case back in, in the um, um, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And so she um, uh, files her lawsuit, and let's say she loses at the district court level, and then it goes up through the court system and eventually gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, by now, more than nine months have passed since she initiated her lawsuit. Probably two or three years have passed since she, excuse me, since she initiated, excuse me, since she initiated her lawsuit. And so um, the baby has been born. The baby is a separate person. Even if she wins her lawsuit, the court isn't going to give her permission to smother her child. I mean, her child is a preschooler at this point. And so um, there is no current case or controversy. Also, the subject is not ripe anymore because it's not ready for a, the court can't do anything to solve this particular problem. Now, it is true that the woman could get pregnant in the future and she could um, want an abortion <laughs> in the future. But right now, there isn't a new pregnancy, so there isn't a case or controversy. Now, the, the rules about ripeness in case or controversy have been relaxed in abortion cases just because of the biological fact that pregnancies are not going to last long enough for the whole court system to consider it. Excuse me. 
Um, so, uh, so there, there is this kind of unusual ex ex exception for abortion cases, but there really aren't very many other subjects where the case or controversy and the ripeness requirements is relaxed. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the steps in the process by which a lawsuit um, begins and then progresses through the system. The document that starts a lawsuit in federal court is called a complaint, and that name makes sense because after all the plaintiff has a complaint against the defendant he's complaining about something that happened i mean somebody who's a plaintiff is mad hey i was done wrong and is filing the lawsuit that's what we call it when it's filed in federal court we have a different name when it's filed in texas state court we call it a petition this name also makes sense because what the plaintiff is doing is petitioning or asking the court to do something. Your Honor, please make the defendant pay me this amount of money or whatever. So the name makes sense in this context. This is another one of these facts that um, you won't find in the textbook, so be sure to make a note of this. I'm gonna show you a um, petition. If, you, um, if you're looking in uh, chapter three, I have a, an example of a Texas petition right here. This is what they look like when they're filed in Texas state court. You can see this is what we call, let me go ahead and label things a little bit. This is what we call the caption of the case. It's going to list the parties. The plaintiff comes first, so these are all the plaintiffs. And then the defendants are right here. We see the case number is put up here, and we can see it's in a district court in a particular county. And this county very possibly has more than one district court. Um, it doesn't mean they have 71 district courts. Each district court has a number, um, and so it's a number for the whole state, not just this particular county would have 71 to be very, very high. Then this is the name of the document. It's original petition. You can see, let me go ahead and. Gonna scroll down here and see. Here's a jurisdictional statement that tells the court it can hear this case. Let's just read the jurisdictional statement so you can see. This court has jurisdiction over this matter for the reason that the amount in controversy exceeds the jurisdictional minimum of this court. Again, remember we're following a district court. Remember there were some courts that had less jurisdiction, null requirements exclusive of cost and interest, and for the reason that one or more defendants are residents of the state of Texas, maintain their principal place of business in Texas, and are doing business in the state of Texas. So again, this is talking about um, a personal jurisdiction. And then we have the venue statement. This is about Texas state courts are pro proper. Now this is about why this particular county is the right county. Venue is proper in Harrison County under this particular part of the Texas statute because the automobile accident in question giving rise to plaintiff's claims occurred in Harrison County when that is one of the bases for venue. Again, there's a whole story here. We can see that there's some statement about damages. We have a demand for jury. We have a prayer for relief. In this context, the term prayer doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't have any supernatural meaning. Historically, the word pray or prayer didn't have a, a, a theological or supernatural meaning. It, a, a prayer was a request, um, a, an imploring of someone. So it wouldn't have been considered sacrilegious to say to somebody, I pray you help me out with this. Um, Nowadays, uh, the term pray or prayer has been uh, limited for the most part to religious circumstances, but this is one of those remnants of that more expansive meaning of the term. So this prayer is to the court. Nobody's saying the court uh, is, is a deity of any type, but the, but the, the a petitioner in this case, the plaintiffs, are asking the courts to give them these goodies. And then you can see at the very end is what we call the subscription where um, the attorneys sign the document. Anyway, so that's what a petition looks like in Texas. A uh, complaint would look very similar as well. So what is a complaint or a petition? It's a formal written document that begins the lawsuit. It contains the plaintiff's list of allegations against the defendant, 
along with the damages, again, that's that prayer section that the plaintiff seeks. When a summons is filed, I mean, when a complaint is filed in federal court, it, also a summons will issue. We have a different name for it in Texas State Court. You aren't responsible for knowing a citation. I'm not going to ask you about this. I will ask you about this one. So this one you don't need to know. This one you do need to know. A summons and a citation are basically the same thing. But a summons is a document that is um, uh, attached to the complaint. And when the lawsuit is served on the defendant, the defendant gets the complaint as well as a summons. And the summons explains to the defendant in layperson's terms what's just happened to him. It tells him that this is a lawsuit that he's been sued, and it tells him the deadline that he has to file his lawsuit. If you, uh, if you happen to, to look at that petition that I just showed you in a little bit more detail, you'll see it doesn't really give any instructions for the defendant. In this case, the defendant is a, is a corporation, so the defendant presumably has attorneys that it can give this document to, and the attorneys will know what to do. But let's say instead of um, the plaintiff suing a corporation, let's say the, defendant, excuse me, the plaintiff had sued you. You were served with this paperwork. You might not have any idea what to do. Do, do I have to file something? When do I have to file it? What do I have to file? Where do I go? What do I do? You've got a lot of questions. Well, the summons will answer many of them, at least get you started on the process. And the process by which you, you the defendant, get the complaint or summons is the service of process. Um, typically, there will be a process server that actually physically gives you the paperwork, both parts of that. So, you are the defendant, you've been served with the complaint or the petition, you've been given that summons or citation, and now you are trying to sort through what you need to do. You have a couple of, of possible things that you can do, actually more than a couple. One is you can file an answer. Fortunately, we have the same name for it whether you're in state or federal courts, so that makes it easy. And of course, the term answer makes a lot of sense because literally what you're doing is answering the allegations of the, um, of the uh, plaintiff. You are going through and saying, yep, that part's true. No, that's not true. Yeah, okay, I agree with that. No, I don't agree with that. You literally go through and answer those questions if you're in federal court. Um, so that's one thing you can do, you can file an answer. Many times in an answer, the defendant won't just answer the allegations that the plaintiff made, but he might have his own beef with the plaintiff. Imagine it's the car accident scenario. Larry's suing Bob because of the car accident. Bob disputes it. He says, no, Larry, I didn't cause the car accident. You caused the car accident. And so not only am I going to contest the fact that I owe you any money, I'm going to turn around and sue you now. And so that would be a counterclaim. Um, if a counterclaim is filed, of course, the plaintiff then becomes the counter defendant and he has to file a reply to the defendant's counterclaim. Now, the defendant in most cases will file an answer, but the defendant has a few other choices. One choice that he has is to do nothing. This is rarely a good choice because if he does nothing, he will have a default judgment entered against him. And that means that he's lost. Um, he, because he chose not to participate in the system, everything that the plaintiff alleged against him is deemed to be true. And now the, the plaintiff can go and collect that money against the defendant even without having a trial. So obviously that's not a good outcome. Um, there are a few other options that the defendant has, and one of them is to file a motion. Um, if the defendant files certain types of motions, then that can delay the time that he will have to file an answer. Here are some examples of some of the motions that you might file. This is not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination. So let's just look at this. Let's first of all consider, of course, what is a motion? Well, a motion is an application, and again, in the idea of, of to apply, it's not literally an application, I mean, it's not like a form you fill out, um, but it's um, a document that says to the court, hey, I am requesting that you do something, please enter an order, and this is what I want the order to say. So it's a request. Um, and here are three examples of motions that are pretty common. A motion to dismiss says to the court, your honor, 
this lawsuit filed by the plaintiff, it's a bunch of hooey. You ought to dismiss it. And this isn't just uh, a situation in which the defendant disagrees factually with what the plaintiff says. I mean, that's almost always going to be the case. But this is a situation, be, uh, I mean, that, that all, almost always happens. And the defendant doesn't get to successfully file a motion to dismiss when there are factual disputes. When the plaintiff says, it's defendant's fault, and defendant says, it's plaintiff's fault, that's for the jury to decide. Um, so uh, the case isn't going to be dismissed if there's that type of dispute. But every now and again, a plaintiff will file a lawsuit that on its face, he hasn't alleged sufficient facts to win, even if everything that he said is true. And so in that case, the court, the, uh, the, the defendant can file a motion to dismiss. And in that one, the defendant says, Your Honor, even if everything that the plaintiff says is true, the defendant still can't win. If the judge agrees, then the judge dismisses the lawsuit and the plaintiff either has to correct whatever the problem is and refile the lawsuit, or if he can't correct whatever the problem is, go about his business. That matter is uh, over. Um, sometimes you can have a, a motion for judgment on the pleadings. This is pretty similar to a motion for to dismiss. In this situation, it is after, though both sides have filed um, their um, answers and uh, their, um, uh, either, either their uh, complaint or petition and their answer. Um, you typically, this one is, is filed after the answer is filed. There may have been something that wasn't stated in the petition or complaint but now the answer is raising as, as an issue. And let's say that when the answer raises the issue, um, then they also fought, then that defendant also files a motion for judgment on the pleadings. Um, and then the uh, plaintiff uh, files a response, but doesn't contest whatever that fact is that is, is new. And so then the, um, uh, the court says, well, we're going to accept um, both pleadings as true, and given that those circumstances were going to roll in, on, in favor of this side or in favor of that side. While both of these are legitimate motions, they're fairly rarely granted. This one, though, is really, really common, um, and it's a very, very important motion. It's what All these are called dispositive motions in that they dispose of the case if they're granted. So a motion for summary judgment is when you go to the court before the jury has been called and say, Your Honor, we've gone through discovery, we've shared all the information, and we just feel like that, that the other side just doesn't have enough facts. They can't possibly win. So there's no reason to put, our, put either side through the expense and hassle of a trial to inconvenience this court with the trial and to inconvenience a jury and witnesses with having to uh, come for the for the trial and so therefore you ought to just go ahead and dismiss the case now now obviously the court um, is reluctant to do this because the, his role the judge's role is not to decide issues of fact his role is to decide issues of law as we talked about previously but when there is no genuine issue of fact um, where the plaintiff has conceded, and usually it's the defendant who's moving uh, for this type of motion, uh, when the plaintiff maybe has made some key concessions, say, in his deposition, and we'll talk more about what a deposition is in a second, and so there's just no recovery from that, that he's, he's admitted facts that make it impossible for him to win at this point, and that's when a motion for summary judgment can, can definitely occur. In federal court, about a third of all cases are dismissed on a motion for summary judgment, so it's not an unusual event. In Texas state court, it's significantly less common. Okay, so now we're going to talk about discovery. This discussion about motions, by the way, motions can occur at any time. Um, I would say uh, these two motions usually occur before discovery. This motion almost always occurs after discovery. So these don't all happen before. In fact, sometimes motions can be filed after the trial. So let's talk about what discovery is. Discovery is the longest single time period in a lawsuit. It's the most expensive time period in a lawsuit. And most legal scholars think it's the most important part of the lawsuit. So it's a pretty big deal. But if you um, are familiar with maybe other countries' legal systems, you might 
um, not really have much of a discovery system in the country in which you uh, grew up or you're most familiar. Um, Great Britain, for example, has a very limited civil discovery process, um, much more limited than we have in the United States. In fact, the United States system is pretty unusual in how robust it is. People can have legitimate differences of opinion about whether our system is better or worse than other systems. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both styles. But whatever your perspective is on this issue, this is the system that we have, and there are no indications that we're likely to move away from it. In fact, I would say that if anything, the scope of discovery continues to increase. So that's just the reality of what we face today. So what is discovery? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is where does it happen on our timeline? And it happens after all the pleadings have been filed, so after the pleading stage, but before trial. And during this phase, both sides exchange information. Now, it makes sense that I would want the other side's information, so that makes sense, but what doesn't make sense is why would I want to share information with the other side, my information? Well, of course, I don't want to. I want to keep that information secret. Um, if it's bad for me, I definitely don't want the other side to know about it. If it's good for me, I'd like to surprise them at trial with that good fact. But unfortunately for me, I don't have the option of opting out of discovery. I have to participate in it. If I withhold information discovery, then I'm not going to be allowed to present that at trial. Okay, so um, discovery is not an optional process. There are five main tools of discovery that we have in our system. The first is interrogatories. This is usually the first one that... Um, uh, one of the parties um, engages in. And you can see in the term interrogatories, we have the beginning of the word interrogate, question. Interrogatories are written questions that have to be answered under oath. And when the person gets their written questions, they have about 30 days to answer those questions. Oftentimes when interrogatories are sent to the other side, with those will be requests to produce documents. And this isn't just documents, it's also data. And so for example, you might have an interrogatory saying, or asking, you know, tell us about um, all the evidence that you have to support this particular argument. And then you might say, and now we want all the documents and data that support this particular document. So these two might be very much uh, in line with each other. These are usually two of the earlier discovery tools that uh, both parties participate in. Another important discovery tool is the deposition. This is in some respects similar to an interrogatory because it is questions that are answered under oath. But big difference is that this is live testimony. So there's no 30-day wait. The uh, attorney asks the question and the witness answers the question immediately. Another big difference between depositions and interrogatories is that interrogatories can only be asked of parties to the lawsuit, either a plaintiff or a defendant. Anyone who has factual information can be deposed. Um, this is much more like uh, being a witness in a trial. It's, uh, it's under oath, there's a court reporter present, usually not a judge, but that's how that system works. Uh, you may recall back when uh, President Clinton was president, he testified about a personal relation, well, he talked about many things, but one thing he did was a personal relationship he had with someone by the name of Monica Lewinsky. And he gave some testimony that many people felt was um, not accurate. And when a person takes a deposition, they are under oath. So if they make an inaccurate statement that they know to be inaccurate, then that um, is a type of perjury and a person can be prosecuted for that type of, of statement. And that was one of the factors that led to uh, Mr. Clinton being impeached by the House of Representatives. Their opinion, the House's opinion, at least many of the congressmen's opinion, that uh, Mr. Clinton had um, perjured himself with his deposition testimony. So, and this, of course, is also under the pains and penalties of perjury. So it's a big deal. You have to be careful in these documents and provide all the information that is re required and that you do it in an honest and, and forthright way. So this is another tool. These are relatively, the first two are relatively inexpensive for the person asking the questions, but are quite expensive for the person who has to answer the questions. Depositions are pretty expensive for both, but they have a benefit in that 
Um, these responses, the attorneys get to be involved in it and they massage the answers and work on the answers so that you're really not getting the impression. I mean, yes, the, the witness has to sign them and confirm that they're true, but they're not um, off the cuff responses. In a deposition, though, the attorney isn't answering, it's a witness answering it in real time. And so you get, as an attorney, the ability to evaluate how strong this witness is going to be, how will the um, jury react to this particular witness. So it's a much more, um, uh, much more helpful in terms of determining credibility. Then there are also discovery tools called requests for admissions. These are when you ask the other side to admit certain things. Many times this is used to um, confirm um, uncontroversial facts like birth dates or dates of employment or the authenticity of certain documents. Finally, and this is not for all cases, but you can have requests for physical or mental examinations in an appropriate case. If the mental or physical condition of a plaintiff is at issue, then that can result in the plaintiff being required to submit to medical examination by a physician that the defendant chooses. Now that would not be appropriate in most business litigation because the mental or physical situation of the plaintiff isn't relevant. For example, in a breach of contract case, who cares whether the plaintiff is healthy or not healthy? That's not relevant. But you can see it in a car accident case, it is important. If the plaintiff is saying, I was badly injured in the car accident case, well, you can see how the defendant would want a medical evaluation of that person to see if the injuries, in fact, are as, as severe as he might be claiming they, them to be. So we have gone through the um, uh, pleading stage and the discovery stage. We filed all of our pretrial motions and now we're ready for the, the trial essentially. But before the trial begins, we're gonna have a pretrial conference and this is an informal meeting, oftentimes in the judge's chambers in the judge's office where the attorneys and the judge get together and work out um, how the trial is going to proceed. It's uh, like a planning session, so to speak. And the goal usually is going to be to narrow the issues so that the trial won't last excessively long. The judge is also likely to try to encourage the parties to settle the case uh, before trial. Uh, so the pretrial conference happens and now we're ready for the trial. The first part of the trial is the voir dire stage. In Texas, we call this voir dire, but obviously if you have any familiarity with French, you recognize that that's not how the French would say it. They might say voir dire, but um, we use that term. The term voir dire is used, as far as I know, in all common, common law jurisdictions, but the way that in that particular area that term is pronounced is going to vary. So one, one thing that you want to do in Texas is say voir dire, but if you were say in Massachusetts and you were to say voir dire, they might think you weren't, uh, wouldn't, might not know what you're talking about. So you have to make sure that you're using the terms as they're used. So what is voir dire? Voir dire is the process by which the attorneys select the jurors who are going to hear the case. In Latin, it it's not, sorry, in French, it literally means to see, to say. It's an interactive process. You you can see here in our little picture that the judge, excuse me, that the attorney is uh, talking to the uh, witnesses and maybe he's asking them questions like, does anybody know the plaintiff? Does anybody know the defendant? And so the, the, uh, uh, the potential jurors get to answer those questions and then the, the uh, attorneys get to um, make some, some recommendations about who ought to be on the jury and who ought not be. Some jurors may be struck for cause. Let's see if I have a slide on that one. I don't. So a cause strike would happen when um, an attorney concludes that this witness is biased in some sense. And that doesn't mean that the witness is a bad person. For example, let's say that I was called for jury duty and the plaintiff is my cousin. Well, am I going to vote against my cousin? Probably not. It doesn't make me a bad person that I'm going to root for my cousin. And so um, when the uh, attorneys are asking questions, they'll ask questions like, who, does it, who, know, who here knows the plaintiff? Who here knows the defendant? Well, I'm going to raise my hand when we get to defendant, and then I will be asked, well, how do you know the defendant? Well, he's my cousin. Uh, how well do you know him? Well, we grew up together. Okay, well, and then 
uh, then that probably would ask me some more questions to confirm how often I saw him, what our relationship is. Let's say we're very close. He's my best friend too. We, we see each other at least once a week, you know, whatever the specifics are. And then that attorney would likely say, Your Honor, um, we move that this person be struck for cause um, from the jury panel. And the judge may well say, yes, you can be excused. You're not a bad person. There's nothing wrong with having cousins, but you're not the best person to be on this jury panel. In large communities like Collin uh, County, it's pretty rare to have cause strikes in civil cases because most of the time people don't know everybody and there's not a lot of um, cause strikes. But wherever the case is, there's going to be preemptory challenges. Typically, both sides get, depending upon the court, three to six preemptory challenges. And the uh, attorneys can use these, for the most part, to strike anyone that they wish from the jury panel. So it's not a, um, a for-cause strike. The, the, the attorney doesn't have to prove to the judge that this person does have some kind of bias. Um, so the, for example, uh, well, let me give you an example. Many attorneys think that elementary school teachers are very kind-hearted, that they are uh, very, and that as a result of them being very kind-hearted, that they're likely to favor the side of the uh, plaintiff and sympathize with his circumstances against the big bad corporation. As a result, plaintiffs like to have elementary school teachers on jury panels, but defendants, especially if it's a corporation, prefer not to have elementary school teachers on the panel. Is that true for every elementary school teacher? Of course not. There's some that are mean and awful people, but that's, again, not the stereotype that we have. But it would be perfectly appropriate for a defendant to say, we want to strike Larry Green from the jury panel. And if the reason is because Larry Green is an elementary school teacher, the judge isn't going to have any problem with approving that. And in fact, usually the reason that the attorney has chosen to use this preemptory challenge with respect to a potential juror, that's not even usually shared. It's really nobody's business um, to, to consider that. But some, there are some reasons that are unlawful. Um, there are certain, uh, even though most, the vast majority of reasons are perfectly lawful, there are some that are unlawful. An example of that is the JEB versus Alabama case. Um, in this case said, a uh, previous case, Batson had determined that it's unlawful to strike people from jury panels because of their race. So if a person is say, uh, um, Asian or African American or Hispanic or white, that can't be the basis for their, them being struck from a jury panel. Um, then in a, a subsequent case, uh, the Supreme Court said, also gender can't be a reason. So um, a uh, attorney might think, well, men would be more uh, more likely to rule in favor of my client, or maybe women would be more likely to rule in favor of my client. So they might want to strike everyone who is not of that particular gender, but that is an unlawful reason to strike. And so when one attorney uses a preemptory challenge in a way that the other side thinks may violate these legal principles, that's when the other side can say, Your Honor, I think that this attorney has used his preemptory challenges in an unlawful way. And that's when the judge says, Okay, well, tell us the reason. And then the judge will make a decision about whether that was an unlawful reason or not. So now we're ready for the actual trial to begin. We have the jury seated. Typically the jury will have six or 12 members depending upon the circumstances. There will be opening statement. The plaintiff bears the burden of proof so he's going to go first and then the plaintiff gets to present his evidence. He's going to uh, present witnesses. That's what we call his direct testimony. He gets to call witnesses. When the witnesses are testifying, he can bring in um, any um, evidence that he wishes to. And But when each witness, when, when the uh, plaintiff's attorney is done with each witness, then the other side gets to cross-examine those witnesses, um, a challenge, impeach them, present or show inconsistencies in the testimony. At the close of the plaintiff's case, the defendant um, gets to move for a directed verdict. Um, this verdict, or this motion 
uh, ask the court to dismiss the lawsuit at this point. Basically what the defendant is saying, Your Honor, we've heard the entire case that the plaintiff has. It's just not enough to win this case. Uh, the jury would not be able to rule in the plaintiff's favor. So why don't you go ahead and dismiss the case, let us all go home, so we don't have to continue on in this case. Uh, this motion has some strategic point, uh, uh, importance that we'll talk about later on. But it's pretty rarely granted. And so now um, the uh, uh, defendant is going to present his direct evidence, his witnesses, and present his exhibits. And then the plaintiff will cross-examine those witnesses. After the defendant is done with his case, then we're ready for closing statements. Again, the plaintiff goes first than the defendant, and usually the plaintiff has a little bit of rebuttal time if, if he saves some of his time. Then the judge instructs the jury about the law in this case, because again, remember the judge tells the law, is responsible for the law, the jury is responsible for the facts. This is oftentimes called a jury charge, but it could also be called jury instructions. Then the jury goes to deliberate, and the jury ultimately in, issues a verdict. Um, it might be in favor of the plaintiff, it might be in favor of the defendant. So let's assume that your side has lost. Um, one of the first, or let's, let's assume you're the defendant and your side has lost. One of the first things you're likely to do is file um, a JNOV motion. Um, and this, this is a Latin abbreviation, but what it, what it stands for when it's translated into English is a motion for a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. Basically, what you're saying is, Your Honor, the jury got it wrong. They misunderstood the facts or they misunderstood the law, and you ought to overturn their decision and render the right decision that's contrary to the jury's verdict. The uh, defendant can only successfully file this motion if it filed a directed verdict motion. If it forgot to do this, it can't file this motion. That's really the reason why most defendants make this motion here. Not so much because they think they're gonna win it because it's a pretty much of a long shot, but so they'll be able to advance this motion in the event that they lose. This is still a long shot. Most of the time it's gonna be denied, but it's a, you know, it's a reasonable long shot. Sometimes this is granted. Now you may wonder, well, why is this one more likely to be granted than the directed verdict? Well, the reason is that if a judge grants a directed verdict, and he's certainly the, the, the plaintiff is almost certain to appeal it at that point, and if the appellate court disagrees with the trial judge, then there's gonna to have to be a completely new trial. I mean, after all, the jury's already left. The jury's forgotten the facts. This is two years, three years later. And so you have to start from square one. But um, if it's a, um, a JNOV situation, we do have a jury verdict. We know what the jury decided. So if the judge is reversed, there's no need for a new trial. Just the previous jury verdict will be reinstated. So um, it doesn't involve that extra work. And so it's more likely that the court will in fact grant a JNOV. But let's say the court doesn't grant a JNOV, you still lost, well, you might file a motion for a new trial. I mean, this is less good for you because you might lose another trial, but you might also win another trial. I mean, after all, there'll be 12 different jurors, so there's always that chance. So you might move for this as an alternative. But let's say you aren't successful with that one. And again, you're probably not going to be. Now you're going to go ahead and file an appeal. There are two levels of appellate courts in both the state and the federal system. The first one is an appeal as of right. You always have the right for this appeal, assuming that you meet the deadlines and you pay the fees. Again, in, in the Eastern District of Texas, which is where Collin County is, all appeals are going to go to the Fifth Circuit. So what do you do when you're filing an appeal? Well, one document you're going to file is a brief, an appellate brief. Um, it's a very formal document, very involved to file, and it explains why you think you ought to win. Of course, if you're on the other side, if you are the person who won at trial, then you are the appellee, and you also file a brief saying why the appellant should not win. In your brief, when you are the appellant, when you're the person filing the appeal, you're going to try to point out errors in the trial court record that indicate you should have, uh, that the judge made the wrong ruling. Keep in mind, we're focusing on the judge, not on the jury, because credibility determinations are not things that the appellate court's going to be interested in. It's interested in mistakes about law that the judge made. 
So your job or the attorney's job for the loser is to find all of those errors. And again, we talked about before that the judges are making these decisions on the fly only one judge. So are there going to be errors? Sure, there's going to be errors. Nobody bats a thousand, right? So there's going to be some mistakes. The problem isn't finding errors. The problem is finding prejudicial errors. Errors that really likely impacted the decision in the case. Um, uh, so the, the fact that there are errors is not likely to be that important, but you have to point out that if the errors that if, if the judge had in fact made the correct ruling, you would have won instead of losing. Okay, so the appellate court reviews both um, arguments, both sides' arguments, reads the briefs, usually there's oral argument, a couple of years passes by, and now the appellate court is ready to render its decision. It's going to issue a published decision in most cases. This has presidential value, so it doesn't affect just the litigants in front of it. And it can do, well, it can do lots of things, but we're going to talk about four things it can do. One thing it can do is affirm the decision of the trial court. This is by far the most common thing for it to do. And basically, it's giving the trial court an A. You did a great job, trial court. We're affirming it. We're saying A for effort. We agree with what you did. But sometimes the appellate court doesn't like everything that the um, trial court did. And so it might modify the decision. It might say, well, you got some stuff right, but not everything right. So you didn't get a Z, you didn't absolutely fail, but you didn't do as well as you could have. You didn't get an A, so you get an M. <laughs> but there's even worse things that can happen. You can get an R, you can get a reversal. Um, and this means kind of the reverse of a firm. Instead of saying, you did everything right, trial court, you're saying you did everything wrong. Um, we're, we're turning over the decision and we're making it the opposite of what you did. Um, so that's e an even worse outcome. When you have modification or reversal, you may also have a reprimand, excuse me, a remand, not a reprimand, a remand. A remand, you can see in this word here, we have the word may, re, which means again. This means to send it back again, to send it back to that trial court and uh, to, for, so that they can fix whatever it is they got wrong. If it's reversal, they may need to have another jury trial or they need to have some kind of new hearing or something like that. There need to be further proceedings. If it's affirmed, though, you don't need remand because everything was perfect at the trial court. So that's what happens at the appellate court, at the Fifth Circuit in our case. But you can also appeal to the next level, to the U.S. Supreme Court or to the Texas Supreme Court if it's a civil case in the state system in Texas. If we're in the federal system, we have a particular... Um, petition that is filed in this context, and we call it a petition for a writ of certiorari. Um, this is, um, the, the, the appellate in this case is saying, Your Honor, we think, you, we think this case is sufficiently important that you ought to hear the case. The um, Supreme Court gets thousands of requests every year for its consideration. It listens, it hears about 100 each year. So it says a lot more no's than it says yeses. So one of the things that the appellant has to do is catch the eye of the Supreme Court. Say something that is going to persuade the court that this is a really important issue. And if it does, then the U.S. Supreme Court may issue a writ of certiorari. A writ of certiorari. First of all, let's look at the word writ. Writ, as you can see, it looks like the word right. And it is a court order. Whenever you see writ in legal uh, situation, it is a, an order from a court. And a writ of certiorari is an order that is sent to the lower court. In our case, it'd be the Fifth Circuit that would say, hey, Fifth Circuit, send up the record. Send up all the documents you have on this case so that we can consider this case in more detail. Um, in order for a writ of certiorari to issue from the um, U.S. Supreme Court, the rule of four applies. And that is a rule that says um, at least four of the nine justices have to agree that this is a case of sufficient importance that they ought to hear the case. I'm just going to get out of here for a second. I'm going to go to the textbook just for a moment. 
Here we have, um, it's on page 34 of this edition, we have the nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. Please don't take offense to this, but I'm going to um, put a D over Mr. Scalia's name. He has passed away. He has been replaced by Neil Gorsuch. So... There are three justices that I care about you knowing the names of. One is the Chief Justice, John Roberts. Another is Neil Gorsuch, our most recent U.S. Supreme Court Justice. And the other is our only African-American Justice, Clarence Thomas. It would be wonderful if you knew them all, but uh, we'll just stick with three um, for the purposes of this class. Okay, so let's go to our, actually, at this point, I'm going to end this lecture, and I'll have a separate lecture in which we'll go through alternative dispute resolution. As always, if you have any questions, please um, be sure to send me an email or talk about, or come to my office hours, and we can talk about whatever it is that you have questions. Thank you for your attention, and have a great day.